before we start, I just need to apologise. I've got a bit of a sore throat. So I've spent this morning planning, if it all goes wrong and my voice fails, I've got a kind of mime version of this talk that I can do. Um, <clears throat> but assuming that's not going to happen, what I'm going to talk about is why your test suite sucks. And I, when I was coming up with this title, I chose this word sucks because it's really childish and like unexpressive. And it's about a kind of frustration people can feel when they start doing test-driven development. Everything's you know, going well. It's all rainbows and unicorns. It's just like Kent Beck promised, and I'm getting all this productivity. Um, and as a trainer and a coach, I come into contact with lots of organizations uh, who are doing test-driven development. And when you're a trainer, you just see problems a lot of the time. Um, People who have a really good TDD implementation tend to not ring you up and say, we desperately need some training. So what I see quite a lot is teams who get into these frustrating situations. They have some problem with TDD. They make mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes. It's hard to do things right. And I get to see all these different problems across different organizations. <clears throat> so what the talk's about, really, is that Don't do this. People get to these frustrating points, they have problems, they start to think maybe TDD is not the right approach. And then they write a blog post about TDD being dead, testing is rubbish, they tell all their friends, I tried that once, it didn't work, it didn't work for me. And there's two things I want out of this talk. One is to kind of encourage everyone to try test-driven development. It really does pay off. When you start doing it right, it gives you all these benefits. It makes you more productive. It increases the quality of your code. It stops bugs. And generally, when you have problems and you feel frustrated, the problem isn't TDD. It's that your test suite's probably not doing it right. Just to get the temperature of the room, can you put your hands up if you're doing automated testing? Wow. And now, put your hands up if you write the test first. OK. So during this talk, we're going to go through different examples, different reasons why your test suite might be a problem. And we're going to talk about how you can get out of that situation. If, you're in, if you've fallen down this hole, how do you dig your way back out again? So the secondary purpose, apart from convincing you all that TDD is the right thing to do, the right way to develop, is that I hope some of these examples will chime with people. They'll nudge each other and say, this is what we were talking about yesterday. This is that thing I was shouting about in the office when I said we should stop doing test-driven development. And the reason people feel there's a problem often is that it takes time to write tests. It takes time and effort. You have to learn how to do it. It takes you time to do it. So there's a, there's a cost involved. And the value you get out of your suite is measured by, is that cost leading to lots of benefits? Is the time you're investing in writing tests leading to better productivity? Is the time you're spending writing tests leading to lots less rework? Is the time you're writing, spending writing tests helping you design much, much better code? If it's not, you're not getting value out of it. Test suites suck when you're not getting these benefits. You're doing the thing because uh, the community has said test-driven development's the right way to develop, but you're not actually getting the benefits because you're doing it slightly wrong somehow. And it sucks when you're, you just feel like you're spending a lot of time writing tests. Like you're writing a bit of code and you're spending a really long time writing tests. How can you make your tests easier to maintain? So first reason your test suite sucks is you don't have a test suite. That's the worst kind of test suite. It's the best, it's the easiest to maintain. You don't have any problems on that score. You're not getting any of the, the value. And I think there's a kind of growth you go through as a team. And it is as a team. It's more important for teams to grow into TDD, I think, than individuals. And it goes through a few different phases. Everyone starts off with manual testing. This is when you're not doing any automated testing at all. Hopefully, everyone does manual testing, at least, before they deploy to production. Um, <clears throat> and then a very natural next step is for people to start doing automated testing, which isn't TDD. But I think it's often part of the progression. 
They then start doing this thing I call test-first development. And then eventually they get to this thing called test-driven development. I'll explain the difference between those two in a minute. Start my alarm. So let's look at what people start off doing. They do my first Hello World program. They enroll in a course to learn how to do development. They don't, nowhere really teaches you to do test-driven as your first entry into the world of computing. Very few university courses day one say, well, what we start with is writing a test. So most of the time, you, you design it somehow. You think about, what should this code do? And often you think about, what should it, how should it implement that? How should it do this thing? You then write the code. That's the easy bit. And then you manually test it. And that testing might, it might not be a big block at the end. As you're writing code, you're constantly having to test it. That might be loading something into a browser. It might be running a command line tool, finding an error, not understanding where the error came from, putting in some var dumps and exits and all that stuff. A lot of time is taken up testing. Big organizations end up having people whose entire job it is to test stuff. They're very valuable people. So typically, teams in this situation, they want to move to automated testing. And the reasons they want to move to automated testing aren't about any kind of advanced ideas about TDD is going to make my design all decoupled. No, it's a very pragmatic decision. They say, we keep making changes here in this part of the application, and this other part of the application breaks. That's called a regression, right? Is that familiar to anyone? Yeah, no one's had that? OK. Um, or maybe they're, they're not having these problems, but they're spending a huge amount of time on manual testing. Either the developers themselves or their 10-man QA team are just spending their time plodding through, checking everything hasn't broken. And the worst case is that they're doing both those things, but still bugs end up on the production server. So you've got an issue tracking system. There's a nice tweet from uh, Robert C. Martin, Uncle Bob, recently. He said, just think about it for a second. You've got an entire system that's built to track all of the defects in your application. You know, what are the implications of that? You've, had, you've got so many, you've had to categorize them and prioritize them. So this growth, growth from manual to automated, it's normally about quality. It's normally about we want to stop having these bugs or we want to spend less time and money finding these bugs. It's about quality, external quality of your app. And the way the team are thinking about it is, this manual testing that we do, we should automate that. It takes time, so we should make it automatic. So during this kind of growth phase, the way you gain these skills, it's just about learning tools. It's about, you know, here's how you configure PHP unit. Here's the different ways it can let you test the code. <clears throat> so for that, you need to read tutorials. You need to get some training. You can buy training from me if you like. Um, or you read some influential blogs that sort of show you how to do things, watch some videos. And the way it sticks in an organization, the way to make this actually work, is to have team policies in place. The team decides we're going to cover all our code with tests from now on. Or maybe just on this one project, everything we produce is going to have tests. And we'll have some tools that make sure we do that. It'll be part of our code review. Um, We'll have a code coverage graph thing that tells us whether we're doing it. Th those kind of things are very useful during this phase. Everyone's just learning to use the tools. That make sense? This is kind of where everyone who only answered yes to the first question are. They're writing tests because they want to automatically verify that their application does what they think it does. So automated testing is very similar to the first phase. It's the same sequence. The first two steps are the same. You think about what it's going to do and then you write the code that does it. But instead of spending time manually testing it, you write some tests that automatically test it for you. And there's big benefits already. Those tests are going to live on in the future. So you can just rerun them again in six months' time, and it takes five seconds to check that everything's the same as it was before. That's a big motivation for most teams. The next step is to kind of start writing the test first. The reason people, the reason teams move 
towards doing a test first. One is that they're influenced by people who do talks or write blogs and say, this is what cool people do. <clears throat> the other is they start having problems that their test suite's brittle and hard to maintain. And often that's, we'll talk about this a little bit later, often that's because the test suite is very tied to the implementation. They've written the code first, and then they're just testing what the code actually does already. And you hear them say things like maintaining the suite is really hard. I don't like writing the tests afterwards because I feel like I'm finished. I've written the code, it works. And now my team lead is bugging me that I have to write some unit tests to cover it. So I'm just going to write really crappy tests, keep that guy happy. <coughs> and this is one of the places people can bail out the whole process and say, TDD just doesn't work. We tried it, didn't work. So to get to test first, that's more of a case of coaching, having influential people in the team who are going to encourage you to try doing the test first or pair with you and show you that it does work better. Right? And it requires a bit of leadership, someone to look up to. Mentoring, if you were at the keynote yesterday. You need a mentor who can show you this is the right way to do code. But just writing the test first isn't the end. When you're writing test first, there's this phase where you still design an implementation first. So you're thinking hard about what the code should do, or you're talking to a colleague about it, or you're drawing something on a whiteboard, depending whether you're a like, visual, verbal type person. But you're still sort of thinking, this is what the code's going to do. It's going to store the stuff internally in an array, in all this implementation. And then you write tests that are going to test the implementation you've got in your head. And then after you've written the tests, then you let yourself write the code. So you're doing it because you've been told test first is the way to do it. But internally, you're kind of cheating. You're designing it first in your head. And people get surprised. They say, the test suite's still brittle. It's still hard to maintain the tests. TDD doesn't work. So to get to real, true, test-driven from there is difficult. It just takes time. The more familiar you are with the tools, the more kind of writing the test first is built into your own workflow. Just naturally, you spend less time thinking about it before you get to the test writing phase. You start off by designing the whole thing and writing tests, and by the end, you just write the tests. And you write tests that don't have an implementation. And they magically better tests. I don't quite know how this works. But by not having thought about how it's going to work, going straight into writing the tests, the tests really just express, this is what the system's supposed to do. And then you implement it. And then you don't have any problems anymore. Um, being realistic, you have different problems. Problems become more things like, is my understanding of what the system should do the same as the customer's understanding of what the system should do? Why are our estimates always wrong? That kind of normal developer stuff. Everyone happy? Okay. So growing through those four phases, it does take time. It took me about 10 years, being honest. I'm probably a bit slow. <clears throat> I see graduates joining our organization now, or actually people still on their university course doing sandwich courses. They get dropped straight into TDD teams, and they go through this process in about three months. It's, it makes me really jealous. The main thing to take from this is that test-driven development is something that you can get to, and it's, it's really easy. It's kind of shocking. It's shocking how much easier it is than this overhead of having to like, think about how things should work first. You just explain how it should work, and then everything falls into place. So, something I've alluded to a lot there is another reason your suite might suck is that you're testing implementation. You can't test implementation if you're doing test-driven development. You haven't, you haven't made it yet. But a lot of the time, in real life, people are writing tests, and they've either written the code first, or they've really thought hard about how it's supposed to work. And that will make your tests worse. So an example is mocking queries. Just to explain some of the terms there, query is a method that returns data. You can think of methods as splitting into two camps. They're either telling someone to do something, or they're asking for some data, right? Like post and get in HTTP. 
So a query is something where you're just asking for some value. Mocking is when you really care, did this method get called? How many times did it get called? Tell me all the details of, did, did that method definitely get invoked? And specifying that detail with a query makes change harder. I'll show you an example. This is a PHP unit test case. Um, and it's testing something that kind of greets people, says hello to them. So we're getting a, a user object, which is a double. <clears throat> We're saying the user object is going to get called once. The method get name is going to get called once, and it's going to return the value Kieran. Uh, and then I invoke the greeter, which is the object we're testing. And then I check that the thing I got back was hello Kieran. This is a very natural test to write. If you've already written the greeter object, you're literally looking at what happens inside the object. And you're saying, OK, it calls get name once. It returns. OK, fine. But what's going to change in future? The main problem with this is the mocking, which is this expects line. Why have I put that in my test? Is that a requirement? The test says that it's testing that it greets people by name, the title of the test. But when I look at the code of the test, it's checking that it greets people by name, and it only asks them their name once. That's far too restrictive. Most of the time with a query, like get name here is a query, you don't care. If someone rewrites the code later so it calls get name twice, it shouldn't break the test, right? An example might be <clears throat> if a user's name could be empty. They might have an if statement that is, if user get name is empty, do this. Otherwise, say hello, user get name. So now it's called twice. This test shouldn't fail. You can just take that line out. As of PHP Unit 4, you can just take that line out. Before that, you had to do user expect any. So this is a much better test. It's actually testing the thing that I care about. If there's a user whose name is Kieran and you greet them, it says, hello, Kieran. It's a very small change, but it makes the whole suite much more impervious to future problems. This is really a symptom of looking at the code writing the code first, saying, yes, it only gets called once. I'll capture that in my test. So don't mock queries. When you're adding an expectation like this is going to get called once, evaluate, do I care that it's called once? If it was called twice, should this test fail? You probably don't really, really care. You only really care if there's like some performance thing going on. That's not really what testing is about. Another example is testing call sequence. This is common in uh, tools that allow this kind of thing or provide nice tools for doing it. But most of the time, you don't care what order method calls happen in. But people get tempted to capture what order method calls are happening because they've looked at what order they happen in in the real code. So here we're sort of mocking, sorry, we're stubbing a thing called a price list. And we're telling it, first time you're asked for a price, return 120. Second time you asked for a price, return 200. Add these two products and get the basket total. Again, this is a form of brittleness. If the, met, if the price is accrued in a different order, things might break. PHP unit pro provides a better way of doing this. So we're saying, return this value map. When you're asked for the price of milk, return this value. When you're asked for the price of bread, return this other value. People only really know, like, are the, is the sequence of method calls mission critical? Probably not. There's two things I want this method to do. There's two things I want to do this object to do when I invoke this method. This thing and this thing. I don't really care what order they're in. So specifying the order of execution of method calls is something you should be very, very wary of. If you ever put that in, you need to evaluate, yes, for this situation, we do really care that these are called in this sequence. It has to be initialized before we start doing stuff, for instance. In summary, just test the behavior you really care about. Don't test the implementation. If you're in that kind of tests afterwards phase at the moment, the best way to do it is to write the test and then close the code and then 
Look at the test, focus on it and say, is everything in this test needed? Am I over-testing? Over-testing leads to brittleness when you make changes. And it takes you more time. <laughs> you have to type more stuff in. <clears throat> Tests will get much more readable the more you take out of them. But the end game really is that if you haven't written the code yet, it's a lot harder to fall into these traps because you don't know what order things are called in. You don't know how many times methods are going to be called. Right. Third reason your test suite sucks is because your design sucks. <coughs> Very commonly, <coughs> when I look at teams who are having problems with their test suite and attributing lots of problems with the test suite, it's so hard to test this stuff. Really, it's because they've got a really crappy design, to be honest. I, I'm not really sure why this is, but if you list out the attributes that make code testable, and you list out the, code, the attributes that make code a good design, they're the same things. I haven't really got a theory about why, but it means the objects are easily isolated. Objects do one thing well. There's a very clear API. There's fewer dependencies between objects. These are all things that you t talk to someone who's big on OO design. They'll be nodding away saying, yep, yeah, that's what your code base should look like. So one example of a problem people complain about, it's painful to have to double all these objects. To test stuff in isolation, I have to make doubles of all the other objects it might talk to. The problem in that sentence is all the other objects that it talks to. When you're feeling that pain of having to get too many objects ready to, just to test something, it means your object talks to too many other people. People? God. I've, I've been programming for too long. So this is an example from a PHP unit setup method, for instance. <coughs> I'm trying to test something called an invoice processor. But to do that, I'm having to create a double of the charge rules object, the charge types object, and the notifier object. And this is just the setup. Inside each of my test cases, I'm probably going to have to stub different return values from those three objects for each one of the scenarios I'm going to test. And this is where people feel like, oh, this is painful. I'm having to learn this API. It's not the fault of PHP Unit's mock library. It's not great, but it's good enough. The problem is that your object actually does depend on three other objects, and that a lot of the scenarios you're testing do involve it talking to these three other guys. Three might seem like a low number. Three is probably the maximum where I feel happy that an object's talking to those other objects. So at the point you start feeling this problem, you start feeling like I'm mocking too much, I'm doubling too many things. Just look at the object, take a minute to stop and say, does it need to talk to all of these things? <coughs> Looking here at an invoice processor, charge rules and charge types, it sounds like invoice processing. The notifier, I'm not sure about. Maybe there's a way I can remove that dependency. Maybe there's a way I can change it into an event or change it into an observer, or do it via decoration. There's a design solution. So too many doubles in your test very simply means your class talks to too many other objects. If you only have objects that talk to two other, one or two other objects, there's a lot less doubling. This is one I've seen quite a lot recently, stubs returning stubs. So a stub is a double that returns a canned value. Like when we told the user when get name is called, return Kieran. I see in test suites that are problematic, stubs returning other stubs. And it's normally some problem with dependencies. Too many doubles is a, means you've got too many dependencies. Stubs returning stubs normally means you've got the wrong dependencies. Here's an example of <clears throat> something that notifies users. It's going to take a user and a contact and an email and an emailer. So that's already a warning sign. There's too much stuff. Uh, sorry, I've switched over to PHP spec. <laughs> so this is how you get doubles in PHP spec. You just ask for them in the type hint, which is a problem. 
because it encourages people to ask for too many doubles. It's too easy. We're considering making it harder somehow. And we say the object we're testing is going to be constructed with the emailer. And when we notify the user, so you call methods on this as if you're calling them on the object you're testing. So when I call notify with this user, the emailer's send to method should have been called with this parameter. That's a very simple test. But then there's this block in the middle, and it looks messy. It looks confusing. What we're doing here is we're stub stubbing stubs to return stubs. So we're saying, when you ask the user get contact, return the contact object. When you ask contact for get email, return the email object. The reason we've had to do this messy thing is because our code looks like this. <clears throat> was anyone at Marcelo's talk yesterday? He talked about design. He mentioned this kind of thing. This is sometimes called a train wreck. We're asking to notify a user, and then we're saying, hey, user, give me your contact. And then we're saying to the contact, hey, contact, give me your email. And then we're doing the thing we really wanted to do. The result is that this, this method, really, has four dependencies. It depends on user and emailer, which are obvious from looking at it. But there's also some hidden dependencies. It depends on the contact object. It has to know that contact has a get email method. If that changes in contact, this breaks. So this messy stubbing here, those two lines, what they're telling us is that the dependency is wrong. Notifier doesn't want a user object. Possibly, you can change it by taking a user object and modifying the emailer. So you can shift the dependency on the emailer, make things cleaner. Or you can say the notifier just gets an email. Instead of giving it a user, it wants an email address but you're giving it a user. And it's asking the user for the contact for the email address. Instead, why don't you just give it the email directly? And the test gets a lot simpler and easier to write. Going back to the implementation thing, it's easier to write this first. You're not going to write the other one first. You'd have to be crazy. Or you'd have to have a, like a really clear picture of how it's going to work inside your head. So stubs returning, returning stubs, it means there's a dependency problem. And the problem is they're not correctly defined. The wrong objects are talking to each other. The wrong objects have references to each other. Two very related issues. The next example, this is kind of a frequently asked question on PHP spec. How do I double or stub just one method on the object I'm testing? It's a very common question. It's never going to happen. Um, it means your object's got too many responsibilities, or possibly there should be two objects. The, the example is something like this. This is a, like a form object, and it's going to handle some data. And if the data is valid, it says valid. And if the data is invalid, it returns invalid. Very simple. And then some crazy stuff happens here inside validate. Possibly you got validate from the parent object by extending some parent form thing. So the common question is, how do I, I just want to test two cases. When validate returns false, handle should return valid. And when validate returns true, other way around, handle should return valid, right? So the, mo the, the instinct of the developer writing the test is, I want to control what validate returns. And you can do that in PHP init because it's got a very big set of tools. You can say, instead of testing a real form, I'm going to test something that's like a form, but we've kind of taken out the validate method. And we've told it validate's always going to return true. And then I call handle some arbitrary data and check that valid comes back. You can do this. This is sometimes a useful technique when dealing with legacy code. But there's kind of an underlying problem there. This bit looks messy because there's an underlying problem. The problem is I'm saying this part of the object should talk to this part of the object as if it's a complete stranger. It's very implementation specific. This test is screaming to you, 
when you call handle, internally it's going to call validate, which is very much an implementation detail. If you're writing the thing first, you don't know that handle's going to redirect to, going to delegate to validate. So how do you solve this? If you want this object to have two halves that are talking to each other like they're strangers, make it two objects. Instead of having a validate method on your form, have a validator. Handle's pretty much the same. And the test looks cleaner. You're, you're doubling validator. You're saying there's a thing called a validator that's always going to say stuff's valid. It's a very naive validator for this particular scenario, right? When I make a form with that validator and I ask it to handle some data, it's going to say that the data is valid. You've taken the fact that there's these two different responsibilities and you've split them into two objects. So if you, want, if you feel like you want to double part of the SUT, that's the system under test, the thing you're testing, it really means you, you probably want these two responsibilities to be separated out somehow. Validation and handling the form data. If it's telling you these are separate concerns. So design is super important. Like, you're not going to be able to test really badly designed code efficiently. But this magic thing happens. Doing testing makes your design better. No one knows why. It's a mystery. Like, it's a good start to just start thinking about your code before you write it down. That's always good. Um, start thinking about it. Maybe you note down those thoughts. Maybe draw a diagram. But the best way to design code is to write down those thoughts in code, in a test. Your design process is your test writing process. I mentioned earlier, this takes practice. This isn't something that just happens. But the more you get used to writing tests, the more you can use them as a design tool. And they'll help you grow as a designer. <clears throat> sort of side note, but people worry about writing tests because they think it's going to take loads of time. It's like some chore. It's very much part of the automated testing phase. <coughs> I've finished the code. Now I have to write these boring tests to keep my manager happy and off my back. So typically with a feature, without TDD, you sort of spend an hour in total, split out. You spend about an hour staring at, into space or going to make yourself a cup of tea to get things going or drawing things on a whiteboard. You spend maybe 30 minutes implementing it. Then you spend 30 minutes checking it works manually. What happens with TDD is your designing is your test. So it's not an extra thing you do at the end. It takes the place of that first phase, and it takes about the same time. To be honest, for me, I feel like it takes less time, but I haven't got any accurate measurements about this. But it's the best way I know to design code, for me now, is to write a test. To think about what it's supposed to do in the form of my hands typing stuff into an IDE. Because I'm a developer, I like typing. Not this drawing stuff, right? And then you spend about the same time implementing it. Maybe that's a bit quicker, because you've got the test guiding you. And then when you need to test it, you just run the test that you wrote earlier as part of your design process. That's the magical bit. The test suite is a way to think about your code. So the test suite is often telling you there's a design problem. There's this design issue. I do a lot of TDD training, and this weird thing happens. We do a whole day of, you know, doing exercises, writing tests first, generating objects on the basis of it. We build up a whole system. And somewhere near the end of the day, someone puts their hand up and says, um, I've got a question. How do you do this like, in the real world? <laughs> and I sort of say, what, what are you talking about? And they say, well, all the examples we've done, we've generated small, small objects that do one thing. They have a few methods. Each method just does one simple thing. They don't really talk to many other objects. I'm sort of nodding. And they say, so how do you do it in the real world? I say, what do you mean? Well, in the real world, objects are thousands of lines long, and they all have 20 methods. And each method has 
50 indented if statements. How do I use TDD to do that? <laughs> the answer is you don't. That's the magic. TDD is going to save you from that stuff. You don't want to be writing that code. That's what bad code looks like. So the test suite is what's going to take you by the hand and sort of lead you towards better design suites. There's often a perception from management that testing is because they're stuck in that phase one transition to automated testing. Your project manager might think that writing tests is what you're doing instead of paying QAs. It's that quality process you're doing at the end of the code. They, don't, they haven't realized you've moved on to TDD. They don't know it's giving you all these design benefits. So you often get a bit of pressure from managers. Can't you just not write the tests this time? I need it really quickly. It needs to be done now. Can you just skip writing the test? What they're saying to you is, can you not think about it? Can you, I need it now. Please don't design it well. I need it now. Don't spend any time thinking about whether it's a sensible solution. Customers shouldn't really dictate your design process. I don't think anyone would, when two developers are sitting drawing a diagram on a whiteboard, the customer's not going to come along and smack the pen out of your hand and say, why are you doing this? Why aren't you writing code? That's the same with tests. The tests are how you design your code. So the, the time spent in tests is very much returned. <clears throat> so the last reason why your test suite sucks is a complicated one. And it's something I've been learning more and more the last few years from looking at where problems arise. It's probably because you're testing across domain boundaries. What? There's very much a concept of what code is yours and what code is someone else's. And the clearer you have that concept, the easier it is to answer these questions like, How, what things should I be testing? Are there things I shouldn't be testing? When I'm writing code that's built into a framework, how do I test that when there's all this framework stuff happening? So one example is testing third-party code. I don't think anyone's crazy enough to write unit tests for third-party code they're using. Um, if you do, please commit it back to the projects. But you can subtly test other people's code without really realizing you're doing it. When you're using frameworks, you're using third-party components, it's easy for you to test their code by accident. And generally, it's a waste of time. Generally, other people's code probably works. Or you can find out if that framework's terrible and full of bugs. You want to spend your time where it's most valuable, testing your stuff, the stuff that adds business value to your product. This is a really innocent example. It's hopefully familiar. I was actually talking to someone an hour ago about a similar situation where you're trying to test objects that implement active record pattern. This is a user repository. It's extending some framework repository, maybe doctrine, something like that, propel, whatever. And it's really easy. It's really easy for the developer, because all they have to do is extend this other thing and then define find by email. And find by email is going to call find. Right? Very simple test. So how am I going to test it? One option would be that thing we mentioned earlier, stubbing out what find does. But I think we agreed that isn't a good idea. So to test this really simple method, this method is going to take me 10 minutes to write tops. To write a test for it, it's going to be a nightmare. Because <clears throat> I've extended someone else's code. I have to understand what that code does. So what I want this test to do is, My object's going to get a validator and a repository. And if the data is valid according to the validator, it's going to save it in the repository. <laughs> no, that's not what it does. We're just testing fine by email, sorry. But remember that for when we get to that example. So this object's basically testing that when I call fine by email, I get a user back. Very simple concept, right? Except 
because I'm extending framework repository, I have to look at the constructor of the framework repository. It requires these things. It requires a database connection. It requires a schema creator. So I spend an hour paging through the source code of the base repository class and figuring out exactly what its dependencies are. And even worse, even though I've given it these objects, it turns out it, call, it calls some methods on those objects. So I've had to figure out exactly internally what the repository class does in the abstract class and stub out the schema creator to return a schema. I don't know what that is. I just read the source code, had to figure out what it does. And then it seems to call something called get mappings that needs an array to come back, so I had to stub that as well. After I did all that work, I had a test that was green and I felt good about myself. But writing the code took five minutes and writing the test took me all morning because I had to load all this stuff about what is this framework repository? What's it doing in its constructor? What's it? Um, what does it need? What dependencies does it have? What does it need to be able to operate? A better solution is to just not touch all that framework repository stuff. Don't get involved. You can treat it as a stranger. So this is the same user repository, and instead of extending framework repository, we're injecting an instance. And our find by email, instead of doing this find, it's doing this repository find. It's a very simple design. But the test is a lot simpler, because I haven't had to get involved in the repository. I haven't got to understand the internals of the repository. I'm just interacting with the repository's external API. So here I just construct my thing with the repository. When I call find this uh, user Bob, I should get a user back. And to make it work, I have to stub what the repository's public interface is going to do. This takes me a lot less time. I don't have to understand the guy who wrote the repository. How did he do it? The gist of it is that when you extend third-party code, you're taking responsibility for all the design decisions inside that object you're extending. That might be fine. For your use case, it might be far more convenient. The other guy might have done amazing stuff in there that you're just going to inherit. It's going to sound fantastic. But bear in mind that your object is, you're saying, I want everything in this parent class and, I'm, and this extra stuff I'm writing. So when you come to a testing strategy, you're going to have to test all that other stuff as well. Generally, this boils down to favoring composition over inheritance. And generally, that's a very good design principle anyway. Instead of extending some convenient library, think about, can I just use it from the outside? Can I achieve similar clean results by thinking about it from the externals? However, looking back at this example here, <coughs> this test, I've actually committed what some people now think is a major sin which is I'm doubling the repository. So although everyone agrees you shouldn't test someone else's code, you also shouldn't double other people's code. So if you want a really clean design, a way to ensure that is just don't double any objects owned by other people. Sounds very strict. The main reason is that testing a double of another object gives you no confidence that it's going to work. I'll give an example of a test with a double in it. Um, this is drawn from my life experience of how I learned not to do this kind of thing when trying to upload assets to Amazon. You remember. <laughs> So here's an example. We're, we're specking something called a file handler. This is PHP spec again. And this is the file handler is constructed with an API that lets it talk to the cloud. So that's an API that's provided by that cloud provider. Think something like the Amazon SDK. It's got an object we own called a file validator. And it's got a file. It gets constructed with the API client and the validator. And it says, the validator is going to say everything's valid for this test. 
and we're going to process a file, and we're expecting that on the API client, start upload is going to be called, upload data is going to be called, and upload successful is going to return a success. So this bit here, we're describing this is our interaction with this third-party code, right? Why don't I want to describe my interaction with third-party code? <coughs> you can, when you're thinking about test specifications, you start thinking about this kind of thing as, this is a description of what I need to do to successfully upload files to this cloud API. Right? The problem is I didn't write the cloud API, so this is more like, this is Kieran's opinion of what you probably have to do to upload files to this cloud API. It's like um, my boss Marcel is here. So it's like if, if I'm preparing for my annual appraisal thing. And like I'm telling myself a little practice story about it. I'm going to go into the room, and Marcelo is going to say, hello, Kieran. And then I'm going to say, hello, Marcelo. And he's going to say, you've done really well this year. And I'm going to say, great, can I have a raise? And he's going to say, yes, you can have double your salary. And then we'll conclude the meeting, and then I'll leave. <laughs> right? That's obviously a kind of make-believe story. That's kind of what this is. I'm going to write that test, and it will run successfully. And when I go and have the real meeting with Marcelo, he might behave completely differently. When I, run, when I run my code against the real cloud API, it might behave completely differently. In the real life example of this, there was a third method called finalize upload, or something like that, that I had to call. But because I didn't know that, I didn't put that into any of my unit tests. Unit tests are all green. They all say, yep, we all work. Then in real life, nothing works. So how'd you get out of that? The problem is, to test something like this, this is like an infrastructure layer, a cloud API. You have to run it against the real cloud API. I think every developer who is writing stuff that uploads to a public service is at some point going to like actually try uploading stuff to the real place. The architecture we have is something like this. <coughs> I've got my validator thing. We didn't really talk about how that works. We just assume it works. We've got this cloud API. This is something I downloaded off the internet. Or we've got a composer package, something like that. And the object I'm testing is this file handler up here. Now, the question to ask is, where are the boundaries? Which bits are mine and which bits are theirs? The blue box is the kind of core domain. So the stuff I'm writing, it's the validator and the file handler. However, the file handler kind of has one foot in another world. The file handler understands exactly how to upload stuff to this specific cloud provider's storage platform. And the fact that file handler is in both worlds is what's making it difficult for me to test it effectively. I'm not saying you can't write this test. I'm saying you can write this test and run it, and it still won't work doesn't give you that confidence level. You're going to have to try it for real, and then you'll think, why did I bother writing that unit test? The way to get out of this is to decouple things quite a lot. <clears throat> so somewhere around this file handler area, we want to add some abstraction. So now what I've done is, instead of the file handler dealing directly with the cloud API, I've introduced an interface. And because I write the interface, I define the interface, that lives completely inside my domain, the domain of my system, my object model. And because, I, because I'm just thinking about it as part of my object model, I've stopped thinking about the cloud API. I realize I just want a place where I can store files, a file store that I can store files in. The, the third-party domain hasn't changed. I don't control that at all. And I've had to write a little adapter called the cloud file store that implements the interface I've defined in the core, and then knows how to talk to the cloud API. If you're in Gordon's hexagonal architecture talk, this is like one of the faces of the hexagon. That's the core domain, and this is the sides, the ports and adapters hanging off it. So how do I test it? Well, it becomes a lot simpler, to be honest. 
The core domain can be completely tested with unit tests, isolated unit tests. What I'm checking is the communication between all the objects that I control. I'm going to test the file handler by <coughs> making a double of the file store interface. It's fine for me to do that. I can make assertions about how people should talk to the interface because the interface is mine. It looks something like this. So I double the file store, and I say, the file store store method should have been called at the end of the test. Very simple, very clean. And actually, it's very in infrastructure independent. Adding that interface will make it easier for me to switch to different cloud providers later. <clears throat> so how do I test the rest? I can't unit test this. I definitely can't unit test this. This is someone else's. And I can't really unit test this adapter because I'd have to double that cloud API. I could write the unit test, but it's not going to tell me whether it works at all. So I cover this part of the system with integration tests. <coughs> integration tests of a particular type, collaborator integration tests. So what we're checking is, does this whole system fill this contract, this file store contract? It says you can store files. Does this whole set of objects successfully store files? That would look something like this. <coughs> You need some kind of test credentials for the service. You'd get a file ready. And you'd make two objects, two concrete objects, plug them together, and you'd say, please store this file. And then you'd have to have some way of checking, is the file really in this cloud provider now? OK. So this is going to be much, much slower than the unit test. But there aren't many scenarios I need to test. It's only got one method, store. Later on, it'll probably get retrieve. But this is enough of a test for the store method. When I ask to get to store a file, it gets uploaded. Maybe when I ask it to store a zero byte file, it throws an exception. Very few paths through the integration test. Lots of, lots of different scenarios are tested in the unit test level. <coughs> and at the end, maybe you test your whole system end to end. I put acceptance tests here. It's more like a smoke test. When I plug these things together, does everything still work? And incidentally, once you've got a lot, if you've got a lot of acceptance tests, you might not need this integration test. You might be really confident that storing stuff in the cloud works if you're testing it end to end anyway. So briefly, don't test other people's code. The main reason is you don't know what it's supposed to do. You don't understand it. You haven't really taken responsibility for it. And the second point, don't test how you talk to other people's code. You don't know how it's going to respond. You, don't, you know how it's going to respond now. You don't know how it's going to respond in the future. You don't know what's going to change. So in summary, use TDD to drive your development. Ultimately, that's the goal. Going through automated testing is good, but keep in mind, I want to start doing TDD. And use TDD to replace some existing practices, like the time you spend staring off into the distance thinking about what the object should do. Plug the TDD into that phase. When you've got problems in your test suite, think through the three things we've talked about. Is it because it's too tied to the implementation? Is it because the tests we're writing, the reason they fail every time we make changes is because we're getting really hung up on how we implement stuff? Is it because our design's bad? Rather than blaming the test, maybe we should refactor our code and make it much cleaner. And are we testing across these domain boundaries? Are we trying to unit test third-party objects? That's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Time for questions? So we, have, we have five minutes for questions, if anyone has any questions. Thanks. Uh, test as design wouldn't naturally lead to um, doing more acceptance and interface testing first and fall down to less uh, unit testing in the end, because that's how I would envision doing the design of the whole thing? Yeah, if that's your natural workflow, then um, yeah. It's a very good place to start, is what does the overall feature have to be? 
and then add, write tests for that, write acceptance tests. Certainly in a BDD workflow, that's definitely what you'd be doing. Um, I didn't really talk about BDD, but it's the same thing as what I've been talking about. Um, so it's a good way to drive your design. If you understand what the overall system has to do, what the overall feature has to do, you can then start with that and then break it down to what do the individual components have to do. And then you know when you've done enough because the feature test starts passing. So yeah, that kind of integrated workflow is definitely something to aim for. Um, the thing with the uh, once expect the expectation to delete like the once or twice, yeah. uh, making my tests less brittle, I didn't quite understand why they would make my test brittle because um, I would never like add a second call um, to get name <coughs> if there wouldn't be a, like a, a requirement and that yeah. requirement would make me change sure. my test first. So like my, ah, once my yeah. test is green, it, it would never go red again unless I change something in the code which would be test driven. Sure. So there's a couple of reasons that might change. Um, often people will, assi will assign the result of a call to a variable and then use the variable and then later decide, actually, it's more readable if I inline that call. I don't consider that should be something that should break the test at all. Um, the other is like a later scenario might impact on this behavior. So there might be another scenario, maybe in the same test case, um, that causes it to be called twice. It's just an overhead to have to find the breaking test, even within one test case for the same object. Does that make sense? Yeah, OK. And then like, often you would like, use um, expectations like once, because it's like, important to check yeah. that the return value is the one which <coughs> you pass into the next construct. So if I have like, multiple calls to get name, and then I have a test uh, which checks that the return value of get name gets passed into another method, I wouldn't know if that was um, from the right call, because I might call like, get name for three different